Greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to today's bonus upload. Before we jump into this bonus, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost you a cent. Click the like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go and folks, they do matter. Now everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump into today's bonus, shall we? Alright guys, there is a video kicking around on TikTok and it states... This deer survived a bear attack. Um, I don't know too much about when bear attack deer. But, to me, I'm questioning if this was a bear, or if it was a dogman, or if it was a Bigfoot. Um, I'm thinking that where the deer it does of course it doesn't say the location of where it was but to me it looks like it's somewhere on the east coast or somewhere where there is seasons like seasons like i'm used to and many of you are um that have four seasons, you know, have a fall, have a snowfall, have, you know, spring, summer. A lot of places don't. They just have kind of like a a summer, spring, California and such. Um, or a lot of places just have a summer and winter, you know. Um, this looks like fall time. And if I'm really looking at it without... Knowing the location, I would say definitely not grizzly country, so it would be black bear country. Um, very seldom do black bear attack deer. Very, very seldom. Uh, that's something you can look up, unless they are super, super hungry. Um, ah, man. And you know what? I'm going to put it at the end of the video. Because I'm praying YouTube doesn't take it down. TikTok hasn't, so I don't see why YouTube would. But, uh, yeah, you guys tell me what you think. Let's get into it. So, as many of you guys know, I am fascinated with feral people. Feral humans. And, supposedly, these feral humans are responsible for a lot of the missing people throughout the state and national parks. Um, being from New York, I was kind of shocked when my mom shared with me a tale she had heard when she was younger about a group of feral people that lived just south of where I grew up and I did some research and I came across this amazing article about these feral people living in the mountainous region of the Hudson River Valley. Now those of you who are not familiar with the Hudson River Valley, uh, I suggest checking out uh, Linda Zimmerman. She's an author and she wrote an amazing couple of books about the Hudson River Valley. It's a, supposedly, it's like a magnetic kind of groove, I guess. It's it's a valley, and there's 
supposedly just this magnetic charge throughout the valley. Um, it does feel weird when you're there. Uh, it is a creepy area, I will say that. Um, on top of cryptids, Bigfoot, Dogman sightings, there has been numerous UFO sightings, numerous hauntings throughout the woods and homes in the area. Uh, dark arts, satanic cults in the forests. Uh, you name it, the Hudson River Valley's got it, including feral people. So let's get into that real quick. New York's Hudson Valley has long been haunted by headless horsemen and living terrors as well. In the hills between Poughkeepsie and Albany existed a clan of artisans known for their semi-wild existence and for being a real-life connection to the region's supernatural past. New York's Hudson Valley abounds in spooks, from the wailing maid of Caterskill Falls to the dreaded horsemen of Leeds to ongoing rumors of a poltergeist in the educational building in Albany. These, along with more familiar specters like Rip Van Winkle and the Headless Horseman, prompted historian Maud Wilder Goodwin to write in 1919 that the Hudson River was endowed more of the supernatural than haunts any other waterway in America. How the region became such a cradle for fireside tales is a matter of conjecture. Washington Irvin, the most famous contributor to the area's spectral reputation, offered one potential cause. Some believed these mischievous powers of the air to be evil spirits conjured by Native American shamans in the early times of the province to avenge themselves on the strangers who stole their land. Or it may be a variety of Dutch, German, English, and Irish settlers each brought their old world hobgoblin with them. This transformed the valley into a haunted melting pot, creating what Henry James described as a shimmer of association, refusing to be reduced to terms. Some sense of legend or aboriginal mystery, with a still earlier past for its dim background. But when it comes to abor aboriginal mysteries, the Hudson Valley has almost as many flesh and blood frights as it does phantoms. Strange backwood clans have been found in the hollows throughout the region. From the ornery so-called Jackson Whites in the Rampo Mountains to the Eagle Nesters supposedly descended from Native Americans and escaped slaves perched above Kingston, to the exceptionally blonde-haired Van Gilders around Glens Falls, my hometown, but maybe the most peculiar of these communities was the wild pond shiners of Taconic Hills in s southern Columbia County. The pond shiners' origins are obscured, to say the least. All that's known is sometime in the 1700s or early 1800s. A small group of families, mostly named Hoddling, Proper, and Simmons, settled on the hill in isolated height above the lake in what is now Taconic State Park. Why they retreated to the woods is a mystery. One story was that they were Yankee near Do Wells on the run from Connecticut's Puritans. Another tale said they fled Hudson Valley rent collectors during the 1840s anti rent wars between tenant farmers and the upstate landed gentry. The few times anyone has been able to get close enough to ask about their origins, the pond shiners said they have no clue how they'd come to live on the hill. It's not even known why the families came to be called Pond Shiners. They were called that and also bushwhackers by the villagers living along the lake, who were probably just looking for another way of calling the clans a gang of hillbillies. Wherever the Pond Shiners and their name came from, once they made their exodus into the wilderness, that's where they stayed, brooding, interbreeding, and growing increasingly more like hermits. Fair-skinned with bright blue eyes, they survived by hunting and by farming hard scrabble plots. Their income was virtually nil, with one notable exception, basket weaving. 
Myth says they learned their skill from Native Americans who also retreated to the lonesome hills. The rounded baskets, which were woven from strips of hard wood, were superior even to shaker handiwork, and modern collectors often confuse the two. The baskets were brought down the mountain and sold in the lakeside villages, usually by an unofficial patriarch of the clans. Today, antique dealers can bring anywhere between $500 to $1,000 for a genuine pond shiner product. The pond shiner's workmanship wasn't widely appreciated back then, though, and they remained impoverished and secluded through the First World War. Only the villagers in Columbia County were aware of their existence, and except for buying baskets, they wanted little to do with the fruit of woodlanders. But time and the Hudson's tides wait for no man, and after the establishment of New York State Police in 1917, the pond shiners began to receive unwanted attention. The new constable had a rough-and-tumble glamour, and after the war, the journalist and historian Frederick Van de Water accompanied the Grey Riders on a series of missions into New York's fearful backwaters. One of those raids was an investigation into a series of lakeside burglaries attributed falsely, as it turned out, to the pond shiners. When Vandewater asked one local what he thought of the accusations against the hill people, the villagers snorted, Steel shucks no, they ain't got spunk enough. Nonetheless, Vandewater had struck a gold mine of sordid pond shiner detail, and his initial 1919 article in the New York Tribune was an expose of what he characterized as rural degeneracy. More pieces followed with tawdry headlines like the Bushwhackers of Columbia County. Strange people populate the hills and they have no religion, no morals, no education and run like rabbits at the approach of strangers. In 1921, the troopers returned to the hill to enforce truancy laws and Vandewater rode along. He included descriptions of both visits in his volume, The Grey Riders, The Story of New York State Troopers, which featured a chapter called The Frightened People. The hills were laced with little blind paths running in and out of ravines between boulders twisting and branching endlessly. These were the highways of the frightened people used for mysterious ends of their own. We came out another trail and met the frightened people face to face. Their clothing was ragged and dirty past all identification. Lank hair streamed over sallow faces that bore no evidence of even a remote acquaintance with soap. The eyes that watched us were not humanly curious. They held a blank terror of wild things, birth and mating and death, come to them as they come to the furried and feathered wild creatures of these hills. They keep no livestock, no poultry, and their efforts at agriculture are limited to draggled little patches of corn and potato, which live or wither as the rain and insects see fit. Thus have they lived, perhaps for ten generations, shrinking in fright from the outside contact. Later in the chapter, Vandewater described the family patriarch the one who delivered the baskets to the village. He was blond to the verge of being an albino with his face of a feeble baboon. His faded blue eyes peered up beneath sparse brows and meeting yours flickered down again. He was stunted and thin. He himself had never seen a railway train. He had no idea who the president was. Admittedly, by the time the community had been reduced to conditions that were miserable even by Pondshiner standards. As isolated as the hill was, it still wasn't able to protect them from the post-war influenza pandemic. The flu wiped about half of them out a couple years back, the sergeant remarked. They died like flies. They buried their dead sometimes. They took the departed and stacked them up in the shed outside the cabin. Just rolled them up in blankets and left them there. There they stayed, 
all through the honeymoon, the full moon in June, and then some. They'd have been there yet if a hunter hadn't passed and found them. After the epidemic, only a few families remained on the hill, but the Grey Riders had little sympathy. After all, they were just animals, said the sergeant at a night supper. They've slipped so far you cannot bring them back. Better if the flu had wiped them all out. Vanderwater did admire, however, the extraordinary quality of the Pondshire's craft. He came across in the village, along with baskets woven so tightly they held water without leaking. The journalist noted, a tea tray stood on the side table. Its base was delicately pleated with its rim of fine fiber, perfectly woven. A handle of braided sweet grass carved gracefully above it. The lines of the workmanship were beautiful and fine. The bushwhackers made this for me, our host said, from a sketch I gave them. Perhaps unhinged by the attention. And who wouldn't be with newspapermen and police, their only worldly contacts? The pawnshiners let their superstitions run wild. Vividly portrayed in Carl Kramer's landmark 1939 chronicle of the valley and its people, the Hudson, the families, were trapped in a dread-filled limbo. Not part of modern society, but not entirely wild anymore either. By this point, some of the families had moved down the hill to live along the state road, but the increased contact only seemed to add to their anxiety. A school teacher familiar with the community told Kramer, the woods they live in frighten them, and the people who live outside of the woods frighten them more. They're always looking behind them to see if they are being followed or to find a way to escape. As Kramer tells it, more than anything, what was bothering the pawn shiners was a witch. Far more than Van, Van de Water. The writer listened patiently when the Pondshire wife named Flo greeted him by saying, That school teacher told me you're going to do something about the witching going on around here. And I'll tell you, it's about time. Kramer asked why the Pondshiners didn't have the so-called witch arrested. Flo scoffed. Twa do no good. You have to kill a witch to get rid of her, and none of those state troopers has got anything but lead bullets. It takes silver bullets to kill a witch. Flo went on to describe the witch's terrifying attacks. According to her, the old woman transformed herself into six cats, which assaulted Flo's cabin, hurling objects around the room, blowing lamps out, and flinging manure across the food on their dinner plates. When Flo told them to stop, the cats said they were going to witch her to death, then went down into the cellar, in bold balls of fire. Nearly every other pond shiner told Kramer similar tales about the old woman. Many of them said it was high time someone stopped the witch in her tracks, which, according to Flo, were like when you draw a star, witches make star tracks. The sorcerer's powers went beyond cats, the pond shiners believed. One man claimed he saw a man without no head. It was a beautiful sight and had on beautiful pants and shirt all white. With the sound of flapping wings, the apparition then flew away into the blonding light. It went off and left us, he said, and we've been worried ever since whether it was an angel or a witch. You can't be too careful around here, the pond shiner warned Kramer. Eventually, Kramer went into the woods and interviewed the accused witch living alone in a cabin in the scrubland the old woman initially said the accusations was just a lot of nonsense that Flo and her friends blamed her for every household mishap. But then she went on saying those pond shiners by the road were a bunch of hard drinkers and card players and that she had heard, just heard mind you, that those self-same drinkers were recently attacked during one of their card games. All of a sudden, all them kings and queens and jacks came alive and treated them all to a shameful and such carrying ons you never did see. They better watch out if they know what's good for them, the old witch concluded. Sadly, the folklorists, such wild happenings eventually disappeared, 
along with the distinct Pond Shiner community, forced into society by schooling the clans slowly integrated. The art of basket making disappeared also, at least partially because the younger generations were so upset at being called pine pond shiners that they no longer wanted to be associated with the craft. The last true pond shiner artisan was Elizabeth Proper, who sold baskets to Columbia County shopkeepers well into the 1980s. Lizzie Proper also carried on the tradition of pond shiner obscurity, refusing to let anyone observe her weaving the methods. One store owner who knew her and laughed. If she liked you, she liked you. If she didn't, you didn't get any baskets. Hardly more phantasmal now than when they were alive and hidden on the hill. The frightened people are yet another legend to add to the Hudson Valley's macabre list. Should you decide to hike into the Taconic State Park, watch out whether dealing with the living or the dead, the bewitched or the witching. You can't be too careful around these parts, as local warned the Grey Riders when they went searching for the Pond Shiners. They'll hear you on the trail, but you'll never hear them. They'll see you too, but you'll not know it. So I wanted to include this because of my fascination with feral people, and I know a lot of you are as well, but local legends are amazing. You know, I mean, it's crazy that these people lived in the mountains for hundreds of years. I mean, even if they didn't start existing in the mountains till the 1800s, the last known Lizzie Proper was selling baskets in the 80s. I mean, that's insane. I would honestly love to find out if any of these people are any of the descendants are still alive and if they've heard any like cryptid details of the woods i mean yeah one of my dreams i guess is to you know go go down south and interview a lot of the southern people sitting on their front porch drinking some sweet tea with them doing an interview but i would love to interview an amish person and ask them what they know of cryptids i bet they they have some pretty wild stories but anyway i hope you guys enjoyed it if not i apologize but i did let's get into some terrifying dogman stuff now though today's second part of the upload this incident was the most terrifying experience of my life. This happened in the fall of 1982 in Baxter State Park, Maine. I lived in Manchester, New Hampshire at the time and desperately wanted to get one last camping trip in before the weather changed and the region would become buried in snow and tourists from out of state for ski season. It was early November and it was still warm during the day and nice and chilly at night, perfect for sitting around the fire and relaxing. I love the outdoors, I still do, but the events of that night in Maine would leave a mark on me for the rest of my life. My wife worked all weekend at a hospital downtown, and both the kids were at their grandparents for the weekend. I called in sick to work, loaded up my Bronco, strapped the canoe on the roof, and hit the interstate. I was on the water late in the afternoon. I loved this area because of how remote it was. I was a few miles from my launch site where the truck was parked when I spotted a perfect place to camp. I paddled toward the shore. This is a great spot, I thought to myself. I set up my little tent and built a fire. I unfolded my pack chair to relax. The day turned into night and I crashed out in the tent. The following day I awoke to the sounds of the birds chirping. It was a little cooler, but still great weather. I took my camera out into the forest to take some pictures. I did some fishing and just enjoyed the peaceful stillness of the remote wilderness. The day was uneventful, and soon after dinner I lie in my tent with my flashlight reading. I must have dozed off because I awoke startled by something moving outside of my tent. I lie still, but instinct told me there was something outside. I could hear the carefully placed steps of something. 
There are moose and black bear up here. Moose can be very dangerous if you walk upon them by surprise. Bears generally smell you before they see before you see them and keep away. I lie still and listened. Whatever it was had stopped at the entrance flap of my tent. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I could make out a faint shadowy shape. I was wide awake now and on full alert. Whatever it was, I could hear it sniffing around and panting of breath. I slowly began to unzip the tent when it ran off. I unzipped the flap of my tent and looked out, just in time to see the branches swaying and hear the sound of something moving through the brush and into the deep woods. The sound of the footfalls told me one important thing. It was on two legs. That couldn't be right. I hadn't seen other people since entering the park and leaving my truck at the trailhead. The tourist season of for leaf peepers had passed, and even so, someone could only reach this location by waterway. I suppose someone could be out here. Someone I hadn't seen or heard until they came sniffing and snorting around my campsite in the middle of the night. I guess it was possible. As the sun rose, I ate my breakfast, but remained on guard. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I felt a presence in the forest, someone or something just out of sight. I kept a forty-five revolver when I camped out here in the North Woods. I wasn't concerned about the wildlife so much as weirdos you may run across. The meth heads, the backwood types. In my experience, the scariest thing you can come across when you're alone deep in the woods is another human. I couldn't be sure if someone was out here, but my paranoia had taken hold. It was dark now. I was inside of my tent. I kept the revolver close and my boots on. I was done playing games. I sure didn't plan on shooting anyone, but I was damn sure to show them I was no easy target. I sat up quickly, I must have fallen asleep again because I was startled awake by movement all around my tent. The shadows everywhere on all sides in all directions. I could hear sniffing and snorting, low grunting, raspy breathing. What the hell is happening? I thought in panic. It didn't sound like people, but the height of the shadows cast against the flaps of the tent in the moonlight revealed prominent upright figures. There must have been five, maybe six on all sides. Fear gripped me as the realization came over. I was surrounded. The low growling started. It was answered back on the other side and all around me. Low, deliberate growling. Were these coyotes? Were the massive shadows just the light playing tricks on me? The growling increased in pitch and intensified, and I knew an attack was imminent. I pulled my revolver and fired straight up into the air. The next moments were a complete blur. I charged through the tent with just the clothes on my back, my 45 and truck keys in my pocket, bolted straight for the canoe and muscled it into the water. I jumped in and began paddling. I never looked back until I got far enough away from the shore. I should have never looked back. They were standing completely still on the riverbank, their bodies crouched down with heads low, eyes reflecting in the moonlight, so I think. They looked like giant coyotes or maybe even wolves, six in total. I was transfixed by what I was seeing. I had never seen a wolf this large or coyote, whatever it was. It was massive. As I sat in the safety of my canoe studying these creatures, they did something that I will never forget. They began to stand up on their hind legs. Each one would slowly raise to two legs. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. They stood like a man. These things, these creatures that had almost ambushed me as their prey. I turned and furiously paddled as the howling rang out behind me. Okay, really quick. I know some people are going to be thinking, Oh my God, it could have been the same dog man group that were that attacked that family in Lisbon, Maine. Um, it could be, but only if they traveled 150 miles north. So I'm thinking it was a different set, probably one that pack that lives in Baxter permanently because it's huge and there's tons of wildlife out there. I mean, 
Main is pretty big if you've ever been there. I mean, it's not just all water. It's really deep. It's crazy. It's a cool state. Um, I've had a lot of fun there. Very paranormal state, actually, too, on the East Coast. Family has house on uh, Mount Desert Island, Bar Harbor. And uh, Soam Sound is there. Soam Sound is notorious for a witch uh, that used to um, lure unsuspecting sailors in to crash along the rocky coast. But that's another subject for another day. Moving on. Third encounter. Myself, my brother, and my mom saw something during my brother's baseball game, which was on a field right next to the Pine Barrens in Suffolk County, Long Island, New York. If we faced the field, the Pine Barrens were directly behind us. It was around 7 p.m., dark out, so it was somewhat covered by trees. But I could make out the silhouette of what looked like a human that was hunched over and trying to remain low profile, but with a wolf's head and fur. It was hunched in a way that you could tell it was bipedal. It was about four feet tall while hunched over. It had glowing red eyes, which was the only reason that I was able to notice it. I stood about a hundred feet away and stayed there for maybe 15 minutes watching, occasionally moving slightly to the side or to the other, like it was scouting us. I told my mother, but she just told me and my brother that it was probably the car's brake lights and that our mind was overreacting and we were both young back then, so we accepted that answer. When I got older, I brought it back up to my mom about what I saw and she said she saw it as well. She saw the wolf's face, the glowing eyes, but didn't tell me because she didn't want to freak us out. I should also mention that there are no roads that led to the wooded area where I saw the creature, so it was physically impossible for a car or anything to get through the hundreds of feet of dense pine barren forest. But again, I was young and took my mother's word. Today's final encounter. It was deer hunting on a cold December evening back in 2005 in California. I had walked to my tree stand, maybe 3 p.m. My stand was about a quarter of a mile from the road, which isn't too far. I climbed up, got settled in for a few hours to see if I could get my first buck of the year. I hadn't seen much action, and it was getting to those last few minutes that I like to call the best time. I noticed the woods went silent, which I knew meant there was possibly a large predator in the area. I just didn't know what kind of animal it was. So off to my right side, probably 100 feet or so, I heard something heavy walking toward me. I was thinking, oh, maybe it's a big buck. What I saw next gave me nightmares for months. The only way I can describe it is it looked like something off a werewolf movie. I didn't know what to do. I was in shock. I couldn't move. This creature, or whatever you want to call it, came within 30 yards of me walking on its hind legs. Now I had a 308 Magnum rifle with me. But, honestly, I was afraid to move. After it went by me and over the hill, I drew a sigh of relief, like, thank God it's gone, or at least I hoped it was. After it went by, though, I thought to myself, what the hell was that? Now it's time it's probably 15 to 20 minutes of light left i didn't know whether to get down or wait a couple minutes later i heard more branches something coming from the same place the first one had come i saw three more of these creatures following that same path now these three were walking on four legs but these things were huge to me they looked gigantic if i had to guess i would say they were one foot taller than a deer would have been guessing they probably weighed 200 to 250 pounds that's how large they were i sat there so still so quiet that i don't even believe i breathed i texted my buddy who was about 300 yards away what i had seen i don't know if he believed me or not but i have never went back to that spot hunting again
All right, so if the video, if you just watched the video clip, that means it's still there. If not, YouTube made me take it down and I apologize. Um, it is pretty insane. I don't think it was a bear. To me, it just looks too much damage to be a black bear. This does not look like grizzly country. I may be wrong. I may be wrong. You know, um, I'm just going how I, how it, how I feel and what I'm looking at and the landscape around. And it just doesn't seem like grizzly country. It seems like black bear country to me. Um, I don't know why YouTube would take it down, even though TikTok has allowed it. TikTok has pretty much high standards. Um, <laughs> like YouTube does. I try, actually, I tried to post the video clip of the uh, Brazilian attack video. I tried to post that and they said nope. Well folks, I hope you enjoyed today's bonus as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. Your support is honestly what makes the channel continue to grow and go and what makes it a special safe place for people to want to share their theories, ideas, and experiences. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant. Keeping an eye on our children, our pets, our family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there, and they are dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.